Okay. <laughs> it's always good to check. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining me uh, for today's seminar. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about cybersecurity. Uh, it's an area that's been a uh, passion and focus of mine for the last 15 years. Um, and frankly, cybersecurity is one of the top priorities right now um, for the electric sector. So the objective of this seminar is to uh, give you I hope a better understanding of the cybersecurity risks um, that the grid is facing, what are some of the approaches that we're taking to address those risks, as well as what are some of the new areas of research in this space and where do we see, see that going in the future. But uh, first of all, just a key takeaway, so we're going to cover a lot, of, a lot of material today, but if you remember nothing else from this webinar, I hope that you'll take away the fact that cybersecurity is really a core component to supporting the reliability and resiliency of the grid. And it's really, I think, an enabler for deploying um, a lot of the new technologies that are, that, that are part of the integrated grid. And I think from my, my perspective and that, the perspective of a lot of, a lot of people in the industry, if, if you can't deploy strong and effective cybersecurity, then you really can't build out and deploy a smarter grid. So it really is a core component of helping us achieve a lot of the new technology um, visions and, and objectives going forward. So with that, I'll go on here. Um, quick overview on the agenda here. So I'd like to start off with a little bit of background information on some of the key research drivers that we see in the electric sector, as well as some new trends um, that are happening on the security space. Um, then I'm going to briefly go over what are the changes to the electric power system and how, how is that also impacting how we view risk and uh, how we take actions as, uh, as cybersecurity um, experts. And also uh, do, a, do a deeper dive on cybersecurity for electric power utilities. So I'll be kind of taking the broad view of, of, how, um, of how we're addressing what tools are available to utilities that they're using um, uh, for addressing cybersecurity. And then I'll go from there to more of a deeper dive into cybersecurity for the integrated grid. And I'll kind of explain what I mean by that um, as well as we get through the presentation. Now there's various terms for the changes in the grid and the future grid, um, you know, such as grid modernization initiative, there's smart grid, and then, but integrated grid is a term that um, EPRI has been using for several years. So I'll go over that um, as well. Uh, first, a little bit of background about EPRI, uh, if you're not familiar with who we are as a company. Um, so EPRI conducts uh, R&D, uh, basically applied research and development related to almost all facet, facets of the electric sector. So that's the generation, delivery, and end use of electricity. Um, and we're an independent company, so we're not affiliated with um, the, any government institutions or national labs. We're not affiliated with any vendors. We don't make products per se. I think sometimes people get us a little confused with some of the national labs or think we're an FFRDC, but we're actually, again, a separate um, private independent company. And so, and we are nonprofit. And one thing that's interesting about EPRI is when we were founded 40 years ago, we're actually chartered to benefit the public. So in our research portfolios and our research projects, we have to clearly state how that research is going to benefit the public as opposed to benefiting the people funding the research or the, or the agencies funding the research. Um, our members, uh, our utility members represent 90% of electricity generated and delivered in the US. And I, I think when you talk to people, even internationally, so there's a view after being a US company primarily, but we actually have members um, from over 40 or close to 40 countries now. So we do have a large international footprint as well, um, which gives us a very uh, unique perspective, I think, in really understanding the trends and technologies um, that are being deployed around the world. Uh, so in my research program, um, I focus on power delivery systems, and that really covers everything from transmission down to end-use devices. So it's transmission systems, distribution systems, you know, control centers, uh, distributed energy resources, grid edge systems, you know, et cetera. So and everything from the transmission down to the end-use and end-storage of, of electricity. Um, our 
uh, program right now has a, a close to 30 members um, from the US, but we also do have other international members as well from uh, Europe, Middle East, East Asia, and Australia as well. So within the security program, uh, we also have a broad footprint, which again gives us a very interesting perspective on the types of threats the utilities face because we see different types of threat campaigns and threat actors that might target Europe as opposed to the US or target both or, or focus on other regions of the world as well. And uh, there's a surprising amount of commonality in terms of things like the, um, the challenges that we face as an industry, as well as the um, threats and technologies that we use as well. And so it really lends itself to this collaborative model where we can pool our resources, pool our expertise together to try to um, address these challenges. And through those interactions with our members, um, able, I can really boil it down to, I think, four main um, cybersecurity research drivers. And you can think of these as areas um, where utilities feel kind of like pressure points in terms of um, uh, pushing them to address cybersecurity in certain ways. Uh, the first one and one we hear a lot about is there's a much more complex threat landscape out there and I'll cover that in a little more, a little more detail in the next few slides, but uh, the, the threats, you know, to the electric sector and to the grid um, have increased in terms of um, sophistication and complexity and number over the last few years. So, of course, that's a high on uh, our utility members radars, but that's also being coupled with increasing attack surface. If you're not familiar with what attack surface is, you can think of it as how an attacker could basically interface with the system, how it can touch the system. So communications channels, you know, network channels, even physical, you know, physical contact with devices, et cetera. So we're seeing that that attack surface increasing um, as well. Uh, another area is this merging of IT and OT processes and technologies. And um, what I mean by that is uh, traditional utilities have been fairly siloed in terms of having their corporate IT systems and various business support systems, you know, fairly separate and managed by different groups than the groups managing the um, transmission or distribution systems, you know, for example, and they have separate technologies there. But over the last several years, we've seen, especially on the security side, kind of a merging of those IT and OT um, areas in terms of uh, people, processes, and technologies. Um, so more, uh, I think more people may have traditionally been IT security people are supporting their business partners for cybersecurity, but we're also seeing more technologies that were traditionally in the corporate IT space now being ported over to um, the operations technology space and control system space. So things like intrusion detection systems now uh, have new capabilities to better help them monitor actual control systems. So they can do things like understand um, SCADA protocols and the behavior of systems, et cetera. Um, so you know, a lot of utilities are kind of looking at how to leverage those new technologies, but also change their processes to adapt to that. Um, the security of emerging grid technologies, and that's really, I, I think, a lot of the focus of probably the last part of this, um, of this presentation is thinking about what are the new applications and technologies being deployed on the grid how do they change um, the uh, cybersecurity risk for utilities, for the, for the grid as a whole, you know, and how, how can we help uh, reduce that risk um, to an acceptable level um, while still enabling the innovation, new technologies um, to be deployed. Another big one, actually, it's not as uh, probably exciting for some people, but uh, changing cybersecurity regulation is, is also a real driver. Um, so they're, um, it, New, um, or sorry, there are regulations in the U.S. that um, cover cybersecurity for the bulk electric system. Um, those are, I'll talk about those a little bit more later. But you know, those change over time. In fact, there's a new one focused on supply chain um, that's going into effect fairly soon. And then also there there are some executive orders that are impacting the industry as well that I'll talk about a little bit later too. So, you know, these are really I think the core um, core kind of let's like, say like pressure points for utilities um, in cybersecurity. Uh, so really quickly, just give you an overview of some of the, the threats that we're interested in. And, and there's a lot of references out there you can find um, that discuss 
uh, cybersecurity threats at a high level, but also um, for the electric sector. So a lot of good resources out there, um, like here I've referenced this um, report from the Director of National Intelligence. And it's very clear and direct that our adversaries and strategic competitors will increasingly use cyber capabilities to seek political, economic, and military advantage over the United States and its allies and partners. It's very, very direct about that. Um, but that also, but also we see um, again, new malware being deployed. Um, here's some quotes and references to a new um, data wiper malware that was found in January of uh, 2020, uh, so this year. Um, also, to look at some more recent threats, you know, the COVID-19 has been really interesting from a security perspective. I, I think what's, uh, there's a quote that um, you should never let a never let a good crisis go to waste. Well. I think hackers seem to take that to heart because anytime there's a big event or something like that, they're very good at crafting phishing emails, you know, et cetera, to, uh, to try to take advantage of, of people um, and compromise systems. And also, as so many uh, companies move their workforces to be remotely, to work remotely very quickly. So also attackers were targeting VPN systems uh, and just overall remote access and teleworking infrastructure as well. And here's some other quotes or references to, to new activities um, that happened in May and April out of North Korea, and then also some um, other OT related systems that were targeted. And especially we talk with our advisors about how they've responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and transitioned their workforces to be remote as well. And they, they have also seen an uptick in phishing campaigns against them. So that also includes um, emails that are, look like they come from their trusted vendors as well so you know the phishing attacks are attacks are very <laughs> very good these days um and finally uh, one another or one area i want to focus on was the supply chain threat so i mentioned that there's new regulation as part of the uh NERT critical infrastructure protection standard um so 13 uh that is related to supply chain threats and that um that's going to affect this year but in addition to that there was an executive order issued on may 1st it's executive order um 13, uh, 13920, got a link on it down here. Um, essentially, it's, it's uh, looking at threats that can come from um, vendors that may have ties to, um, to foreign governments, for example. And uh, it's basically directed um, the DOE and other groups to put together criteria for putting particular equipment on a, what they call pre-qualified vendor list but also work with the industry to identify what is some of the prohibited equipment that's already in use and how can they help asset owners identify, isolate, monitor, and replace the equipment as appropriate. And so this is fairly recent. There's probably more questions than answers on this. So I'd say most of us are in a wait and see um, approach right now, but it's just an example of how, you know, how quickly I said new, new regulations or new, new administrative orders like that can impact how utilities do business and how they address cybersecurity. So cybersecurity, you know, it's a threat for a lot of different areas um, and sectors. So what makes the electric sector, I guess, unique in terms of how, what are their challenges and how they have to address um, cybersecurity. And I think uh, some of it comes, or a lot of it comes down to un understanding some of the differences between IT systems and these operations technology systems. And so, uh, on this slide, I've provided a, a couple of different areas where there's significant um, differences between your more traditional enterprise IT systems and the OT systems that actually uh, support the operation of the grid. Um, a big one is understanding the difference between the IT and OT cybersecurity objectives. And so there are really there are three objectives within cybersecurity that, that we focus on. Um, it's called the CIA triad, the uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, and all, most of the controls and processes we put in place are there to support um, one or more, all of those um, security objectives at different levels. Um, on the, so on the IT side, it's a lot of the focus on protecting data and, and, and protecting the confidentiality of that data. So confidentiality and, uh, and integrity tend to be the higher priorities there and availability is a priority as well, but not always as critical. Whereas in real-time systems, like the ones that run the grid, availability is actually the highest, um, highest cybersecurity objective. So keep the systems running. 
followed by integrity and to usually much lesser extent um, confidentiality because uh, if a lot of the main um, systems that run the grid uh, do not um, have, I guess, confidential data. They focus more on SCADA data and operations data there. Um, just to jump around a little bit, another one is the device customization. You know, these are embedded systems that are out there on the grid. They are customized for a particular um, system, a particular operating environment. Um, they may use unique hardware that's, you know, different than your traditional IT hardware. They're resource constrained um, in terms of memory capabilities and processing power and also can use um, um, embedded operating systems that may be proprietary as well. So that limits some of the security tools that you can use with them because you can't use your off the shelf um, security tools. Another one uh, area that I think a very, very big difference is this long life cycle. So a lot of IT equipment, you may re refresh that every two to three years, give or take, to take advantage of you know, better processing power and more, and more memory. However, when you deploy equipment and systems out on the grid, you know, those will be there for 15 to 30 years. Um, and on top of that, you already have a lot of equipment that's been deployed. So you have a large footprint of equipment that's also been out there for a significant amount of time. And so you can think from a security perspective, you know, the challenges associated with uh, trying to secure legacy equipment as well as new equipment, um, but also thinking longer term, you know, how do we maintain security um, on, uh, on these systems that can have that limited computing power, or at least even if it's up to date now, we'll certainly feel very limited in 10 years um, there as well. So that also causes some, some challenges. So I you know, just wanted to give you a little bit of that background information, because I think understanding these threats and understanding you know, the difference between IT and OT are I think, really foundational to looking at what are the risks um, that we're trying to address right now for the grid. So, uh, so now I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, talking about you know, what are the changes that we're seeing um, on the electric power system and also how does that impact cybersecurity um, for the grid. So here you have, I uh, consider the very traditional electric, electric power system where you have uh, central generation um, it's running and then that basically pushes out electricity to loads, you know, to very, not, not static loads, but uh, very predictable loads, you know, so you have uh, central generation actually supporting predictable consumption and, um, and electricity use out on the, out on the edge of the grid. Um, so this is a historical model of how the grid has operated. Now, if we look at where the power system actually uh, it says looking forward, but depending on where you are, you find a lot of these technologies deployed today. Um, and then some of them or a lot of them coming, you know, uh, coming out in the future as well. And it's really a, just a dr dramatic difference here. And you've probably been, I guess, hearing in these seminars about some of the different technologies um, that are being deployed on the grid. But uh, it really changes how we operate, um, how we operate the grid. And so now, you know, generation again used to be centralized. Now it has to become more flexible. So generating plants need to be able to ramp up and ramp down um, to match demand. Um, transmission distribution systems, they're becoming more controllable, more resilient um, as well. And that's being driven by a lot of what's happening on the right side of this picture. And so it's very interesting to think about these changes as you know, consumers are becoming energy producers. So now you have things like your solar panels on the residential areas, um, as well as office space, et cetera. Um, also loads are becoming more interactive and dynamic as well. And uh, that means that um, you can have better like uh, demand response systems, you know, for example, um, as well as energy storage systems deployed out on the edge of the grid. And to make this all work, it requires um, integrating a lot of sensors um, out on the grid, a lot of uh, more equipment monitoring. Um, this new grid, it's it got a lot of great capabilities, so it gives you, you know, 
uh, better visualization of what's happening on the grid, better awareness um, also. And, it, and the goal is to really integrate a lot of these new technologies that are happening on the grid edge. So you really integrate the distributed energy resources these, um, as well as these other grid edge systems. And so to make this happen, you can see there's, it's going to require more telecom systems uh, as well as um, cybersecurity really being part of that infrastructure, you know, to build this out. And you can start to, you can think of this as being more like um, a system of systems, I guess, you know, with multiple parties now taking part in the generation and use and storage of electricity. So in a huge, huge shift from where we were before in terms of traditional uh, way of running the grid and then where we are now, where it's again, very flexible, resilient and dynamic. Um, for the power system. Let's see here. There we go. All right. So, thinking about you know the some of the threats that I discussed, and also um, these changes to electric grid. You know how how do how do utilities um, go about addressing cybersecurity? Um, for their systems. And there's a couple of different ways to frame that. You know, one good one to think about is what are the drivers for the security decisions in the electric sector? And some of these I covered, but you know, here it's kind of a good, a good summary of it, you know, the emerging technologies and capabilities. Um, so how are we, um, what are the new um, grid technologies that we're deploying? What are the new business capabilities we're trying to add? And how do we secure those? Uh, again, the reliability and resiliency of the grid. How do we ensure that um, power continues to flow and get to the end end users? And then, if there is a cyber incident, how to how do we fight through that and maintain a, a level of resiliency in the grid? I mentioned the regulations as well. Um, another is financial risk. Um, you know, so you know, cybersecurity incidents can certainly disrupt um, operations. They uh, may um, increase uh, liability um, for utilities as well. And then also data privacy. So earlier I mentioned that confidentiality was not um, quite as high of an objective uh, for, for utilities in the past. However, when you think about some of the technologies being deployed on the edge of the grid, like smart meters, for example, you know, smart meters allow utilities to collect much more granular data about um, the electricity usage of, um, of their customers. And with that comes some uh, privacy concerns. Um, if the utility is also interfacing with other systems like uh, DER systems, uh, demand response systems, et cetera, there could be some other data privacy concerns as well. And so that's a little bit of a newer, newer concern for, um, for utilities, um, but definitely that's up there in terms of what drives their their um, cybersecurity decisions. So, to uh, frame how they, I guess, think about and how we think about cybersecurity in the electric sector, you know, there's no shortage of frameworks, there's no shortage of documents and guidelines and you know, recommendations out there for cybersecurity. In fact, it can be very, very overwhelming if uh, if when you're first starting to to get into this space. So with this slide, I wanted to help break that down for you all so that uh, you can see and maybe understand a little bit better some of the different aspects and functions that we're trying to support in cybersecurity. Uh, so one starting point is what is your overall framework for cybersecurity? You know, so your framework really drives how you create and govern and implement your cybersecurity program. Um, and so NIST uh, actually developed the cybersecurity framework for critical infrastructure a few years ago. It's on, I think, version 1.1 right now. And that document has been, I think, adopted fairly widely now by, by utilities, especially in the U.S., in terms of really leveraging as a framework for assessing their secu security program, looking, um, looking at the risks, um, developing profiles for where they, where they are now in terms of security functions and capabilities and where they want to be in the future. And so if you want to pick an interesting document to start with, it's you know, maybe a little more approachable. I, I think the NIST cybersecurity framework is a good place to start because it's fairly high level there. And so it tells you a lot about what you should be doing, what are objectives you should be looking at, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how to do them. Um, so there are various 
documents that um, look at mandatory and discretionary requirements for a cybersecurity program. That's where you get into a more of how you know, you're, you're going to support the objectives and the framework there. So I mentioned earlier um, that we do have mandatory um, re uh, cybersecurity regulation for the bulk electric system. That's this NERC, NERC CIP, NERC SIP here. Um, and that again covers bulk electric systems, so that's generation as well as transmission systems. It does not cover distribution systems. And that's actually a really key point when you start to look at cybersecurity for um, the integrated grid and for grid edge systems. You know, the, the current regulation covers the bulk electric system. And there, it's a, basically a set of uh, security standards that are meant to develop and create a baseline level of security for the grid. So you can go beyond the requirements and you're encouraged to go beyond the requirements, but the idea is to basically set a floor, you know, so a minimum, minimum bar there. And utilities uh, in North America can be audited against these requirements. And they come with some pretty hefty penalties um, for violating them. Uh, so if, if you are found through an audit um, as violating, you know, some of the NERC SIP standards, you can be fined up to a million dollars per day per violation. So, you know, that's a fairly significant penalty. Um, so that, that certainly takes cybersecurity and puts it up fairly high in terms of um, enterprise risk <laughs> for utilities, at least for their, uh, their the systems that support the bulk, bulk electric system there um, as well. If you Google NERC SIP fines, uh, you can see where different companies, especially in the last two or three years, have actually started being fined multi-million dollar fines for violations with NERC SIP. So um, definitely uh, <laughs> pay a lot of attention to those. Those standards, um, some of the discretionary requirements, this is where you get into various controls catalogs um, that are out there. The NIST A-53 is a very popular one in the US. Um, then also there's IEC standards like 62351, which focus on some um, particular smart grid technologies as well as IEC 62443. You know, and again, those are more discretionary ones, but they, they give you guidelines on how to implement controls um, and what, what controls you should be looking at. Um, the another component is how do you actually manage your overall security program? And a, a common standard for that is this ISO 27000 series. And again, that's really looking at your information security management system. So that's how you actually are operating, you know, the security program there. And that's very commonly used um, around the world, actually. And then also uh, there's the cybersecurity capability maturity model, um, which the DOE developed a few years ago. And uh, a lot of utilities use that um, to look at <clears throat> basically how mature are they in their various um, processes and capabilities um, within different parts of their, um, of their company. And the reason for that is because cybersecurity is it's not something that's a one and done thing. You know, you don't just go deploy controls and then call it a day. You know, it's supported by a lot of processes um, as well. And those processes, you know, are, are things that you can mature over time as well as your overall cybersecurity capabilities. And so these maturity models help you track that and decide where you want to be in terms of your overall cybersecurity maturity as well. And so, again, it can be quite a landscape to uh, uh, look at and, and try to learn um, <clears throat> when you're first getting into cybersecurity for the electric sector here, um, but at the end of the day, it's also important to remember that cybersecurity isn't there just to, you know, as, as its own end, I guess. It's uh, something that's there to support the mission of the business. So it helps support, again, the, the reliable generation and transmission delivery and use of electricity, at least you know, for utilities there. So these things are actually tied to your business objectives, but cybersecurity is a discipline and a practice. And so it does, <laughs> it does take a little while to, uh, to get up to speed and and uh, really really learn it in depth. Um, so, but to help, I, I think uh, take that down to a level um, it's a little bit easier to understand. Thought it might be useful to look at um, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, and again, I think it's very very popular um, with a lot of a lot of our utility members. And one reason for that is it's very straightforward in how it breaks it down. And so it, it divides security into these five function areas of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, then 
uh, pairs that with different categories of activities and then subcategories that aren't, aren't listed here because there's, there's a lot of them, as well as in, uh, various um, informative references to, to help you achieve the objectives in the NIST cybersecurity framework. So as you see, there's a lot here, but it's really very practical when you go through and actually read what it is it's trying to tell you to do. So let's pick governance, for example. So governance could cover how how is your cybersecurity supposed to be organized? How are you assessing it? Um, what metrics are you using um, to assess, uh, assess your security program? Um, risk management and risk assessment, risk management strategy. So are we act accurately assessing and monitoring and communicating risk? Um, and I think that's a, a big question when we start looking at the integrated grid and some of the new technologies we're being, that, that are being deployed, making sure that we're doing that properly. Uh, within supply chain risk management, do we trust the equipment we're deploying? You know, I mentioned that's become a very hot topic in the industry <clears throat> in the last two years as, uh, you know, looking at for uh, potential um, attack vectors um, for, for the grid. And there's um, lots of examples of counterfeit equipment coming out onto the grid. You can also find some examples of potentially more targeted um, equipment uh, uh, being being deployed as well, or things moving into that supply chain. And so, a lot, of, a lot of utilities want to ask themselves: you know, do we trust this equipment? Do we trust the processes that our vendors are using to secure their equipment as well? Um, so, a lot of activity happening in that space, you know, and, and also are we mitigating risk from third-party service providers? So in some cases that could be cloud providers, you know, for example, if we're using cloud services or if some of our vendors are using cloud services or mitigating the risk from that. <clears throat> um, ID management access control. So how do we manage passwords um, and remote access to field devices? You know, utilities, if they have large fleet of substations, they can have thousands of devices that they have to be able to access remotely and be able to manage um, manage those passwords in an efficient, effective way. Um, also, looking further down at the protective technology, uh, do we have the right architectures and technologies to protect these OT systems? And this is an area that we do a lot of work in, um, looking at security architectures for new grid applications and making recommendations on guidelines and controls to help help utilities protect their OT systems. Also, getting down to the detect area, do we have visibility into our OT networks and devices? Um, that's, that's an area that we've seen a lot of movement in the last few years. I mentioned earlier that there are um, new intrusion detection systems available now that uh, better understand OT systems. And so more of them are being deployed. But in, historically, you know, there's been a lot of dark parts of the OT networks that may not have been monitored. You know, so utilities are asking themselves, do we have visibility into the network so we know everything that's going on there? And then also, are our tools configured um, and effective for these OT systems? Do they understand the processes? Do they understand the protocols? How do we reduce false positives when we're trying to deploy these systems in the OT space? And then, um, can, if there is an incident, you know, can our operators identify and respond to a cybersecurity attack? Do they know what to look for? Uh, this is actually a very challenging area. SCADA operators are not cybersecurity experts, um, but they may be the first ones to notice uh, if something unusual is happening um, on their systems or on their SCADA systems in particular there. But it can also be very difficult to determine if something is actually a cyber attack or if it's a, uh, a device that's malfunctioning, for example. And then if there is a cyber incident, do we have the right forensics tools and capabilities to even determine which devices have been compromised? You know, I mentioned earlier that there's um, a lot of proprietary um, operating systems and applications um, that are used in, in these devices. So you can't, you can't just use your off-the-shelf forensics tools um, when you're doing your analysis um, as you're responding to an incident. So and these are just a, a few of the areas, but I wanted to take a moment to kind of translate what do these high level categories mean in, in terms of practical questions um, that we're looking at in our research and that utilities have to address on a daily basis. Um, so to, 
help address some of these questions. We do, um, again, research in a lot of different areas in our cybersecurity program. Um, over time, developed a fairly holistic program um, to look at transmission distribution, security for uh, DER and grid edge systems, as well as incident threat management. And we publish a roadmap um, every year where we uh, look at what are the future states in cybersecurity um, that we'd like to achieve as an industry, and especially from the perspective of, of um, electric power utilities, what are the gaps to get there, and then what are the actions to help achieve those future states. And so I'll provide you a link here um, for our roadmap. And our roadmap doesn't just look at power delivery systems. It also includes some of our cybersecurity activities that are focused on the generation sector, um, the nuclear sector, as well as some cross-cutting areas like security metrics and supply chain security. And so I would encourage you to, if, if you're interested in learning more about the challenges and where we see um, you know, some of the research going very, very detailed level, you know, at least from the utility perspective, you know, I think it's a good, a good reference document. It's freely available. Anybody can go, can go download it and take a look at it. And it'll, it gives you a summary of research we've done in the past, where we're doing this year and where we see things going in the next two to three years as well. So we've covered a lot of material. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I wanted to give a little bit of background on some of the drivers for cybersecurity, then talk a little bit about um, changes in, you know, that we're seeing in the electric power system, and then broadly talk about um, you know, what, what are some of the challenges and resources you know, for the electric sector more as, as a whole. You know, before diving into cybersecurity for the integrated grid, we'll talk a little bit more about some of these newer technologies and applications. Uh, but before I did that, since we have covered a lot of material up to this point, I wanted to pause here um, to see if anybody has any questions. Oh, no. Thank you, Galen, for making a quick stop here. And uh, for audience, if you have questions, please click the icon, which is a raise a hand. I'm going to unmute you so that you can ask some clarification questions. Okay, uh, seems not. Uh, but we do have one question on the Q&A portal. The question is about, uh, I think you uh, touched a little bit uh, at the first beginning and you may uh, elaborate a little bit more when you discuss uh, integrate. Uh, electrical grid uh, for cybersecurity. The question is why can't IT associated with OT can be segregated or separated to overcome some of the challenges with upgrade cycles and the resource limitations? Okay, um, let me repeat that back, Mr. So the, the question is why can't um, IT be, do you say, separated from OT yeah. to help um, with some of the um, challenges around the refresh cycles and what was the rest of the question that uh, resource limitation uh, resource limitations right so um, you know in general uh, you know utilities do have some separation between their IT and OT systems um, they're usually not air gapped you know that's a term you might hear in the industry and it's I think a bit of a myth I don't know that many utilities actually have true air gap between their IT and OT systems um, a few do but most don't go quite that far. And there's a lot of business reasons why they don't have them completely air gapped um, as well in terms of how they leverage um, data um, you know, uh, from, the, from the grid systems um, there as well. But they are you know, segregated and, and inter the interface between IT and OT systems is fairly, fairly controlled. Um, there so usually won't have you know, any SCADA systems like on the internet, you know, for example, um, or easily accessed from the IT um, side over to the OT side. Again, that that's that's fairly controlled there, and so I, I think that helps with some of the more um, internet-based threats, like you might get from phishing emails. Um, but certainly not impossible uh, for a, I think a very determined attacker to potentially pivot over to the OT side. But it's it's fairly difficult there, and so that that does help provide. Um, a, well, a good amount of protection and reduce the risk. Um, but I think some of the challenges that we're seeing is, when I mentioned the um, growing attack surface, you know, is that out in the field, 
You have more field area networks being deployed. You have a huge variety of communication technologies out there from you know, microwave systems to uh, cellular systems. You find Wi-Fi out there, uh, Zigbee systems, you know, et, et cetera, as well as the fact that some uh, devices are not um, uh, as physically protected. So you have a lot of pole top devices. You have devices on the side of somebody's house, you know, for example, if you think about smart meters. You know, so uh, so why you know having that separation helps between IT and OT reduces some threat vectors and attack vectors. Again, now on the OT side, you know, looking out to the integrated grid, that you definitely have a big increase in that attack surface there as well. And so that's what also what we're concerned about. And uh, and so that's where I think having those limited capabilities for doing things like encryption or authentication. Uh, can be a challenge, you know, moving forward. But hopefully that answers the question there. Any Great. other questions? Yeah, let's move on so we can okay. ask. Okay. Great. All right. So, yeah, just uh, a few more slides here. Um, I know it's about 14 minutes left <laughs> for the seminar. I uh, want to make sure I have at least uh, some time at the end as well to pause for questions. Um, but, right. Thinking, uh, focusing more on the integrated grid. And again, that's the term that some people might call the smart grid. For example, I like to think of it um, again, more as this integrated grid because we're trying to integrate a lot of these different technologies and players into the grid, um, and, and which, is, uh, which provides a lot of benefits, but I think it provides a lot of challenges, um, several of which are listed here. So these are challenges for, for I think, mostly grid edge systems. So, one is this uh, diverse ownership and management of distributed energy resources. So we have some PER systems that are utility owned, um, operated and managed, but then you also have a lot of customer owned uh, as well as third party managed um, DERs. Uh, so this could be uh, things like a PV on your house, you know, for example, um, could be storage um, uh, in, in a home, electric vehicles, uh, home energy management systems, you could think of uh, building management systems for commercial buildings, those could be controlled by a third party. You have um, solar aggregators um, that could manage large numbers of, um, of solar panels as well. And, and so it's really uh, <laughs> become a, a very, again, diverse area. And uh, the, ch the main challenge of that is when you look at it from the security perspective, you know, it's not clear what everybody's responsibilities are in terms of cybersecurity. Um, so, you know, I, you, as you may remember from the earlier part of the presentation, there's a lot of activities, processes, technologies, you know, and functions in, you know, that, that go in to support cybersecurity here. And utilities will secure what they own and operate. But now you have uh, the, these other groups as well that uh, are actually managing systems that could impact the operation of the grid. Um, but we may not know how they are actually securing their systems. So again, you have this lack of clarity and responsibility. So you know, you can think about who's responsible for things like um, deploying patches. You know, who's tracking vulnerabilities for these grid edge systems? If there's an incident, who whose responsibility is it to respond to that incident? And if you are responding to an incident, how do you coordinate that across these different groups here as well? So I think that's an area that we, we definitely see some challenges. Um, and also just the, the pace that these um, technologies are being deployed. It's, uh, it's accelerating fast. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a lot, of, a lot of new technologies going out there. There's new, you know, these new functional entities. I mentioned the aggregators. There's also um, pressure for low cost solutions. So, you know, it, the, that, which usually doesn't support uh, economics of cybersecurity very well when, when people are more interested in things like time to market um, or their uh, particular profit margin there as well that can sometimes impact how security is, is managed from the vendor perspective. And then also there are, I, I think, like established standards for these grid edge systems. You know, so uh, a lot of the companies are working in this space are not necessarily security experts, some of them are fairly new companies, you know, so you may bump into a lack of security knowledge and best practices. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, what we're concerned about is that you know, we think this is increasing uncertainty into the cybersecurity 
posture of the grid. And a part of it is just not knowing how um, these these other parties are architecting their networks, how they're doing their um, access controls and whether security controls that they're that they're deploying as well. So it's something to <laughs> to think about. And and uh, I think from the utility perspective, there's only so much you can manage and control um, on that as well. In addition to that, when you look at some of the specific grid edge systems, there are um, standards gaps in that, um, in this space. You know, so here I've uh, just highlighted um, three different um, standards and rules um, that are out there that are related to um, DER and grid edge systems. One's a 1547, which is a DER interconnection standard. And so it's um, really uh, focuses on interoperability um, and it does specify some mandatory protocols that need to be supported at, the, at a smart inverter's local communication interface. And it specifies that it should be, should use uh, 23.5, DMP3, um, or SunSpec Modbus. Now, if you're familiar with these protocols, you'll know that uh, DMP3 and SunSpec Modbus do not have security built into them. And it's only the IEEE 2030.5 um, that actually requires uh, uh, I guess a secure secure communication there, um, you know, but it really also doesn't as a standard, you know, like Tripoli standard itself doesn't directly address um, cybersecurity for communication protocols, cybersecurity for smart inverter or the interfaces, not at least not in its current current form there. Um, and also, uh, you know, in California here, we have California rule 21, which looks at these generation facility interconnections. And so if you look at on the graphic on the right side here at the very top, you can see the rule 21 recommendation, which again is this like interconnection between the distribution system operator, for example, and I uh, here we just use the aggregator system you know, in, in, the, in the cloud. You know, it's just one potential interconnect there and it does specify, it recommends the 2030.5 there. But as you can see from this, this uh, large red circle here, that does not drive any requirements for how an aggregator might interface with the smart inverters themselves um, or any security controls on that. And that doesn't mean that there aren't security controls being implemented, but they're not required. And uh, because these are proprietary systems, we just don't have a lot of um, information to insight into how, how those connections are being, um, being secured. So a utility can specify um, cybersecurity and privacy requirements through a DER interconnection agreement. So there's one tool that they have, you know, to drive some um, security requirements, and that can be helpful in some types of interconnects. Uh, it could be helpful for other systems like microgrids, for example, um, that could connect connect to the grid. There's so there's some tools, but then again, there's there's just a lot of uh, connections and unknowns out there as well. Um, so uh, I mentioned the IEEE 2035 is recommended as, um, under Rule 21, but if you really dig into that standard um, and and you have a background in in security and PKI, you know you'll notice that the model that's proposed in 2035 actually has some um, cybersecurity risks that are inherent in the way it's 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 been developed. Um, so for one, there's not uh, ability to do certificate revocation. On it, which you know, it's kind of it's a very important aspect of, of doing um, a PKI. Being able to revoke um, certificates could be compromised, and then also this risk of uh, of CA collapse, where you can allow root CA signing, you know, for end devices as well. Um, and so that's kind of it's another another challenge that uh, we've raised some awareness on um, that's that's looking at being addressed right now as well. And so. It's kind of interesting when you first look at it, you might say, okay, yeah, I see some secure protocols that are recommended out there, but when you actually diagram out the systems and look at the different interconnection points um, and how the, the technology is really being deployed, again, you see some uh, some gaps in terms of sec known security requirements out there and, and, and security regulations as well. And so that's something that we are uh, <laughs> very interested in and focus on a lot in our research. Um, which brings me to the to the next slide. So I do want to um, mention and bring your attention to um, 
some of our research projects and activities to help address cybersecurity for the integrated grid and for these DER and gridage systems in particular. And it can be particularly overwhelming at first when you when you first look at it because of all the different technologies, um, applications, and players that operate in the DER and grid edge space here. Um, so we looked at um, a security architecture for the DER integration network, and I put a little star by that one because this report is available at no cost. So you can go to epri.com, type in this title, and you'll uh, be able to grab that report and download it. And I think these are live links in here as well. Um, and so you can grab that once you um, get once the slides are available here. Um, but then we're also looking at a lot of different aspects of these systems. So looking at grid security for end-use devices, making recommendations on um, how how those devices should be should be secured. So in-use devices could be things like smart thermostats, home gateways, et cetera. Um, also energy storage is uh, a, a big area uh, as well. You know, there's a lot more storage being deployed in California and across the grid in general. And so last, uh, last year we looked at what are some of the recommended guide, guidance you know, and considerations um, for uh, cybersecurity related to those systems. Um, then in this year and next year, uh, we're continuing the work we're doing, but also expanding out to look at cloud security um, for DR and grid edge systems. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of them, but some third party companies already use cloud services to manage um, these grid edge systems. Um, so we're looking at security architectures for that, uh, as well as DR network gateways to help control um, uh, the integration of smart inverters. Um, as well as uh, hardware security for smart inverters. And then finally, working on it, making recommendations to help address and uh, well, to help understand some of the security challenges with 2030.5 and how they can be addressed. So those are areas that uh, we're looking at and how we're trying to help address some of these security challenges. Um, here I wanted to list some future research directions for the integrated grid, and this is broader than just utilities. Uh, you know, this is more industry, I think industry issues that we need to look at. Some of these I've referenced already, like what really understanding the cybersecurity roles and responsibilities across all of the industry stakeholders in the integrated grid. So that's vendors, uh, uh, aggregators, um, you know, utilities, you know, these various other third party management systems, et cetera, you know, make it, uh, making sure we actually understand what their roles and responsibilities are as it relates to cybersecurity. Also, I think we need to adopt a more comprehensive cybersecurity framework for the integrated grid um, that really addresses all of the functions in the NIST cybersecurity framework to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. We spend a lot of time looking at protection um, in these protocols and, and other architectures that are you know, being recommended right now. But again, security has to support all of these functions um, and we need a better, more comprehensive framework um, for that. Also, I, I think an interesting area of research would be developing more, uh, what do you call multi-party um, grid risk model. So how do we understand the risk from these third parties? If they're compromised, how can that impact the operation of the grid? I think that's not well modeled and understood right now. And then, you know, in supporting the, the first two bullets, creating a, a framework for collaborative security management. And so this will provide a way for um, a regular utility or others, you know, to basically track the cybersecurity um, uh, tasks among all these different interconnected systems and, and third parties as well, and be able to demonstrate and know are these, are the different are the different participants in the grid actually, you know, supporting the roles and responsibilities um, that they have, you know, as, as part of this overall integrated grid as well. I think that's a fascinating <laughs> research area myself in terms of how you might be able to automate that, um, how you incentivize people to do that um, as well. It kind of brings a mix of economics, technology, and, and policy, I think as well, if you want to try to design something like that. Um, but I think as an industry, uh, not, not just every, but as an industry, that's some, something that uh, we really need to look into, I think, to make sure we have a very secure grid going forward. So with that, I think we're actually down to one minute, so I apologize for that. Um, I'm pausing it for any other questions. Uh, oh, let, 
there's some questions on the Q&A. Let me, let me pick a relatively simple one, but I think it's very interesting one, especially for a lot of students who may not have a, a experience in, in this area. So can you give me a more mm -hmm. specific example about the potential risk uh, for the integrated grid, potential cyber risk for the integrated grid? And uh, uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, the, the attendees list one thing, which is, uh, hey, uh, for example, if uh, the cyber hacker into my solar panel system, what they can do with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, that's a great, a great question. And uh, if I had to pick one specifically, you know, I, I think, yeah, looking at the solar panels, in particular, looking at um, aggregators um, of those systems. So if an aggregator can directly control or curtail, you know, generation um, through, you know, by, by leveraging a connection to smart inverters, you know, they could actually control the amount of solar generation that's happening and, you know, across the systems that they, that they support. Um, these aggregators can also do firmware updates, you know, as well. So imagine if an aggregator were hacked, then, you know, somebody were able to basically control those systems, then they might be able to curtail the, the power production or turn it back on, you know, and depending on the level of PV penetration in the service territory, that could that could have a significant impact on the distribution uh, the distribution system. It may not be enough to quote take down the grid, but it it, it, it certainly on the distribution level, uh, I think it could cause some cause some real problems there. Um, but again, that's probably a specific example. I know it's, uh, that hasn't happened before, um, but if if you want one that's probably easy to relate to and understand, that would be one that I, I would be concerned about. But. Thank you, Galen. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I think I received a lot of questions regarding where we can get to the recorded video. And uh, I want to uh, I type the answer on the chat. And if everyone, if anybody interests, you can go to any of the last time for that EDU bits and watts. There's a tab which is events. You go to the past events, you will be able to see all the recorded uh, webinars in uh, last uh, uh, five talks. And uh, here is a uh, uh, Galen's uh, contact information. And uh, so if mm -hmm. you have any follow on question, you know, feel free to reach to him. Uh, thank you Galen again. And uh, last but not least, I want to especially thank uh, Wahila Wilkie, Chin Wu Tan and uh, Mohammed uh, Rasli. Uh, I'm not sure you, you guys be able to see them from, from the Zoom, but they mm -hmm. are the smart grid coordination team and uh, uh, for all the audience attendees, you received the email from them and a reminder from them to attend this webinar. And also they responsible for coordinate all the speakers regarding the uh, practice session and the logistics. And uh, this is new to them. And uh, historically we all conducted the smart grid seminar from the physical meeting and the workshops has been <laughs> running, Qingwu has been running that for five or six years. This is the first ever we moved the whole quarter a seminar to the webinar form. I want to especially thank all of you, spend a lot of time to coordinate and make this happen. Thank you. And also thank our audience. And if you're interested in the future events, you also can go to the uh, Bits and Watts website. Uh, we partner with APRI with the support from VMware. We have a special virtual workshop. It's uh, 90 minutes each day, three days long. Talk about integrate customer DER what is the standardization, what are the security issues and the integration issues, all of these things. Okay, thank you everyone, good afternoon.